we can get started. Thanks to all of you for coming today. Uh, I know it's been a very long and intense week, even though it's only been a few days. Uh, and this is probably the, the last panel keeping you from, from happy hour. So, uh, but, but what we can promise you, uh, is a very interesting discussion over the next two hours. And so I want to thank you and welcome you, uh, to the securing the ICT supply chain from cybersecurity threats conference. My name is Christopher Roberti and I'm senior vice president for cyber space and national security policy at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington, D.C. Now, many of you know this, but some may not. The U.S. Chamber of Commerce is not an arm of the U.S. government. We are a private sector organization with a mission to represent the interests of the American business community. And we advocate on behalf of our members, and we work very closely with, with our government and also other governments um, uh, around the world to advance uh, the the interests of or to advance uh, free economies, open markets, and economic uh, growth. Today we're going to talk about information and communications technology supply chains, or ICT supply chains. They're key elements in the global economy. One could argue that they underpin just about every aspect of trade, investment, health, and security worldwide. And while technology professionals and cybersecurity experts have known this for years, it's only recently that the broader public has become aware of the importance of ICT supply chains, their promise and their potential vulnerability. The proliferation and ubiquity of ICT supply chains and the seemingly infinite applications they serve from cell phones to pipelines has illuminated the stark reality that these technologies can be vulnerable to cyber related attacks from global adversaries. And as a result, governments worldwide are searching for ways to secure ICT supply chains, much of which involves working with the private sector. And that's something that we support very, very wholeheartedly. Today, we're going to hear from a group of government and private sector experts on a range of important topics related to ICT supply chain security. What are the threats? What are the vulnerabilities? What steps need to take place to move towards a more secure future? First, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, our first keynote speaker, uh, Zaki Sorenstein, Head of Supply Chain Security at Chetmarts, a global cybersecurity company that provides technology, expertise, and intelligence aimed at securing internet applications. He's going to spend a few minutes with us uh, with a very interesting, uh, with a very interesting uh, 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 presentation. So, Zaki, welcome. Hi, guys. First of all, I'm uh, really happy to be here. Uh, I think that the subject uh, we are talking about is a global problem. So I'm spending a lot of time in Israel, but I'm more than thrilled to see uh, um, visitors and partners from all around the world with, because I think this is a global problem and we need to think about solving it in a global, in a global fashion. So I'm going to spend a couple of minutes talking about uh, one aspect of software supply chain. It's not a, an easy problem to solve. Uh, and I'm going to show a couple of things from the attacker point of view because I think one of our greatest mission is around awareness and people need to understand exactly what the problem, how should we define it, and then how can we move forward. So, um, of course, I'll be happy to answer any other question you have afterwards. Uh, I'll, I'm still going to be here and uh, you can uh, uh, direct message me. Or I'll be happy to share my presentation later. So when we're talking about supply chain security, and that's the reason that we are here, uh, we all understand that supply chain security is clearly a problem. And it's not just the people in this room who, who feel they're about that. We are actually getting recognition from all kinds of different organizations in the world. Leading uh, analysts like Gartner are talking that the number of uh, software supply chain attacks will rise dramatically in the next couple of years. Uh, the complexity of our um, development life cycle opens a lot of attack surfers for attackers to, sorry, open a lot of, uh, uh, of space for attacker to attack us. Uh, of course, uh, President Biden executive order uh, paved the way when talking directly about uh, software supply chain security, starting to set the standards, starting to get better visibility so we can move forward. And uh, I'm really excited about this initiative, and I'm sure it's one of the first initiative and other was, and other will follow. And for me, one of the problems when talking about supply chain is a hot topic is everybody's defining supply chain. Software supply chain is a different topic or a different angle. 
So for me, supply chain is the same parallel as the traditional supply chain. When you look at the traditional supply chain, there is no one weak point of, uh, that we need to secure. It's a process, and we need to secure the entire process. Uh, think about car manufacturing. Although your car comes from one vendor, this vendor actually buys the air conditioning for a diff from a different vendor and the wheels from a different vendor. But there in traditional so uh, supply chain, we have a set of standards and regulation. This is not necessarily the same in software supply chain. So uh, I was, I'm very happy to talk about Salsa. Salsa is a framework being pushed out by the Linux Foundation, being backed by Google and other company uh, giants like Microsoft and Amazon. And for me, it's very, very good that we have Salsa because now I can define the problem, not as the way that I think we should define it, but in a more common way. So once we can define the problem, we can actually refer what's our priority, how should we fix it. So when we are talking about Salsa, uh, about the way that we produce our software, we are talking about a developer is actually uh, writing his own, his own code and storing it inside the network. When we are ready, we will release, we will do what we call a build, which is like a workflow, because in many cases, we don't have one developer. We have a lot of developers, so we need to merge all of their code together to get the application running. And in many cases, we will use what we call dependency, which is open source dependency. And then we have a package or an application and the process goes on and on. So just looking at this, you clearly understand there is no single point of failure that we need to fix and that it. An attacker can attack us at the developer level, at the build level, as we saw with SolarWinds, in open source packages, as we saw in numerous incident on the, on the way that we distribute our application. So a lot of time when we have a lot of different attack vectors, we need to prioritize. For me, looking at this, I clearly understand that all of the uh, um, steps that are actually outlined here, uh, we have a lot of work to do but CISO has some control around it. For example, a CISO can decide he wants his developer working from a secure workstation. He can demand his developers to use two-factor when they're actually submitting or reading code. He can actually uh, ask that the build server will be secure in some specific network segments. The one point that I felt that, I felt that we were missing control, we didn't have good mitigation, were around open source. Because basically, we're taking code from strangers. And we can't ask them to use two-factor or to sign on a legal bill that they, uh, if something bad will happen, they will compensate me or my company. So basically, we're automatically taking code from strangers, putting, putting it inside our products and hoping for the best. And understanding that, I need to understand how, how widespread open source is. I mean, it's okay that I think that open source is a problem, but is it a big problem? And the truth is, in, when you develop a modern application, everybody's using open source. So you can find it everywhere. Except, uh, actually, 80% of the code in our application comes from open source. So my developers are doing what we call plumbing. They are taking a bit of logic, uh, uh, adding a bit of open source packages, and oops, I have my application. Developers want to deliver fast. They want to use open source. We've been talking about agile development for years, and that's the current mindset. A lot of time, developers doesn't understand what, what he's actually doing when he's choosing an open source package. Let me give you an example. When my developer is choosing an open source package, and the contributor seems legit, and that package seems reliable, it doesn't necessarily understand that inside this package, there's another open source package from a different contributor. And in many cases, it's not one-to-one -one ratio. It's more one-to-many ratio. So who's vetting all those people? So my developer is actually doing the right process when he's choosing the first package. Let me give you an example. Suppose I'm installing a package called CNCGS, which I think is legit. The contributor seems okay to me. It's well maintained. Actually, I'm installing all of this. I'm installing hundreds of different packages from hundreds of different persons. Do, do I really expect my developer to actually test each one of those packages and validate each one of those persons? So basically, it's a jungle. And number of packages are just increasing. So I don't think everybody is some, so I don't think anybody's gonna stop for us until we get everything straight. 
And just NPM alone has more than half a million packages a month. So who's looking at the code? Who's validating the code? Who's making sure it's safe? So I could come in and ask you, should we or shouldn't we use open source? But that's a rhetoric question. The answer is we are using open source. So the real question is how to choose the right open source. So basically, why automatically do we trust open source? Even after, even after off all, that, all that I said. So basically, from the developer standpoint, of point, it's open. So if it's open, I don't have time to read the code, but somebody else is reading the code for me. If there's a problem, somebody will detect it, that for me. We have a scoring mechanism. So if something is popular, it's automatically good. And it gives us a trustworthy feeling. I find that uh, some out of a trust paradox, because every day, all of us are being bombarded again and again and again with zero trust. So even inside our network, our people, our system, we don't trust them automatically. But if somebody posts some, some code on GitHub, that's legit. Because it's open, somebody else will actually notice that. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of when a good package goes bad. So we can see if that's the problem, why are we not seeing those? So guys, meet Brandon. Brandon is an open source a Rockstar contributor. He actually maintains more than 41 different open source packages. So he's actually spending a lot of his time giving back to the community. He's trying to make a positive impact. One of the packages that he's actually publishing and contributing and maintaining is called Node IPC. It's actually maintained for eight years and it's quite popular, more than one million weekly downloads. So based off the normal tests that we are doing, oh, it's well maintained, it's popular. Why shouldn't I use it? He has a good reputation. And even if you are not explicitly, explicitly asked about this package, there's a good chance that you, are, you, are, you are using it because of the transitive nature I just described before that. Another package will use this package, will use this package. But as I told you, the open source software supply chain is an evolving field. Let me share with you a new attack we saw this year. So this year on Mertz, we actually saw Brandon add new functionality to his open source package. It seemed a bit cryptic, but let me, let me show you what's inside. So basically, he added a new functionality that does three new things. First thing he's doing is accessing a website called IP geolocation. So we can all guess what the website called IP geolocation is doing. It's telling me where I'm, where I'm from. It could be from Israel, it could be from Britain, be from the US. So why does Brandon care where his code is running? Second thing he's doing is checking, is my code running in Russia or Belarus? If so, and you don't need to be a developer to understand that, delete, 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 delete every file on that computer. Uh, after, the, after the file he deleted, he actually added an art emoji instead. So why did Brandon do that? Was it Brandon? Was it an attacker? What happened? And we can all guess the answer. What happened with Russia and Belarus this year, right? Brandon stands with Ukraine. It was his way to protest what is happening to Ukraine. And this is not an attacker. This is actually Brandon in his own, in his own words. Guys, you download my software for free, so I'm allowed to wipe your computer. It is all document, license, and open source. And to be honest, I don't think he did any legal violation. He actually coined the word protostware. So I don't think it's a good idea to mix politics with open source, but this is the world that we are living in right now. My team actually tracked five more protostware since then. And I'm, I'm a bit anxious because I know that there are Russian contributors out there also. So I don't want this to be the norm. And it's not just me. Um, we are seeing the community sending, Brandon, that's a, that is an abuse of power. Don't become what you hate. Uh, basically saying what we are saying. Uh, thank you for teaching me not to take the quotes, uh, quotes from strangers. That's basically what we're saying. Don't take quotes from strangers without verifying. And of course, once this was discovered, this package was banned. Great. Even if my computers are not in Russian Belarus, I wouldn't want this code. But can anybody tell me if his company is using one of the other 40 projects from Brandon? Is that legit? Is that an acceptable risk? 
Do we actually know about that? Because right now, all we have is a scoring mechanism for vulnerabilities in code. Never thought about those kind of incidents. And we are not just seeing activism and protosware being more and more a, a thing of a trend. We are actually seeing a lot of attacker trying to abuse the trust that developers are giving into the open source system. So as Uncle, Sam, as Uncle Ben said, with great power come great responsibility. My question in this form, whose responsibility? Is it my developer responsibility? My CISO responsibility? Is it the government, GitHub, Brandon? So we are seeing more and more advanced persistent threats uh, moving into this field. Let me give you an example. So as I said before, one of the main metrics we look at is good reputation. If somebody has a good reputation, that will block most attackers from entering this field. Sadly, this isn't the case. So a good reputation is hard one. Let's see. So I'm showing you again from the attacker point of view, which is really interesting because we need to understand what attacker are doing, an attack called typo squatting. You saw two packages, and the name of the packages is similar. The attacker is, is hoping that a developer will be will will do a typo squatting and download the, the sorry and download the malicious package. So this is a very common attack, typo squatting. But what is less common is what I'm going to show you. So if a developer will, by accident, download the malicious package, he won't notice. And why is that? Because both the original package, Pumpy and Pumpy.io, has the same code. From, so from the developer standpoint, it just works. The problem is that Pumpy.io has a bit extra. He has one uh, uh, added dependency. And this dependency actually try to steal all the details from this developer to an external website. By the way, I'm saying this developer, but think what will happen if this developer will, will not notice and send this package to his customer. So it could actually impact more than just the developers. So we understand that Pumpio is malicious and Pumpy is legit. So what should a developer do? Looking at this, now that we understand that one of them is malicious, what do we expect our developers to do? Basically, we tell them, look at the reputation, look at the popularity. So we don't have likes in open source, we have what you call stars. So guys, if you, look at, if you can look at both of the packages, you'll find something interesting. They both have the same popularity, the same stars. For many of my developers, that's enough. They did my, their, their, their own work, they make sure that it was, it, it was okay. So from an attacker point of view, how was the attacker able to steal the reputation so easily? As I said, I would like to show you the attacker point of view. So let me show you how attacker is doing that so we can realize the risk. So is it that really to steal reputation? Yes, you don't have to maintain a package for eight years to do that. So basically what you're seeing here um, we have a huge research team focused about software supply chain attacks, and this is our attack simulation system. So every time we learn about a new attack, we simulate it so we can test our defense defenses and be uh, better well informed. So we're going to publish together a malicious package, the same as the attacker would do, to see how difficult it is, what are the barriers in the process. So basically, when you publish a malicious package, or any package to be honest, all you need to do is Identity. So nobody is checking your identity. All that you need is a, an email account. Once you have an email account, you're allowed to publish any package that you want. So I'm going to use a, some kind of a, a one-time email account, Gmail account. The second thing I'm going to do, I'm going to write a name. So in this case, I'm writing supply chain demo. But think of an attacker. I would probably go for Pumpy.io 1, Pumpy IE, trying to trick somebody to do a type of squatting attack. After that, from the attacker point of view, I need to give it a version. Please be aware, if you are attackers, never use version one. No developer will ever use version one. So I'm gonna do one, two, three. And now's one of the funny part in this story. 
suppose uh, <laughs> the joke is on us, but it's still funny. So um, basically, when I have my code ready and I want to publish my package, I go to an application store. Think of, think of it like an Apple application store or an Android application store. In this case, it's Python, so it's a store called PyPy, but it could be NPM or other stores. And the store is asking me, okay, you want to publish this package, that's great. Can you just tell me what company do you work for? What project do you come from? So, of course, as an attacker, I'm not working with anybody. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to GitHub and randomly pick a popular package. Or in this example, I'm going to test the Economist eBooks. I have no idea what this code contains or if it's code at all. Wait for it. We've seen the stars. That actually means that Python, based on my world, is automatically going to give me all the reputation from the original project. Now can we realize is hard the reputation uh, easily found? So basically, this is the place that my researchers are doing what we call the payload. They are doing what we call the malicious payload, wrap, dropper, ransomware, all of those stuff. So basically, um, in this case, I'm going to do like a dynamic dropper, different lecture. And that's it. I have the package name. I have the email, which is like a fake email the project that I belong to, and just click Next. Wait for a couple of seconds, and the package is published. That's it. That's all you need to do to have a highly successful um, open source package attack. By the way, Pump.io had more than 70,000 downloads. So they, they make an impact, and we need to think about what do we do, because even after I found Pompeo and reported that got it removed, it was never tracked. So there is a good chance that there are 70,000 organizations out there still using Pompeo and don't even realize that they are infected. So what do we do? Again, it's a big problem. It's a tough problem. How can we start solving it? So first of all, we need to understand that the entire way that we think about on code right now is focused around logical flows what we call the vulnerabilities. Of course, we talk about log4j, but let me tell you something. We had vulnerabilities before log4j, and we have vulnerabilities after log4j. What have really changed in the last couple of years is the attackers have entered the fields, and they are doing malicious stuff. There is no logical flow in the code that Brandon writes to delete, delete, delete a file. It's not a buffer overflow. It's not a SQL injection. So we need to change the mindset to a cyber mindset. The same way that we did in IT, I would say 10 years ago, 15 years ago, with the supply chain. Sorry, with the, uh, um, with the way that we start tracking TTPs and ATP groups and understanding who are we facing. We need to share information. So um, sadly, when I report on a malicious package, it's been deleted. No other researchers in the world have access to it. We need more researchers and more hands on deck, people looking at the problem and solving it. Just deleting the file and saying, okay, it's done, no problem, won't get us to the solution. So we need to, uh, the industry to find, uh, to share the information of malicious package, malicious samples, full metadata, sharing inf information in a central repository. Because right now I have different negotiation, what with PyPy, what with NPM, what with Maven, what with GitHub. We need a central repository. So people can look at the problem at the whole and start thinking on ways to fix that. We need better standards. As I said before, a lot of those time, those packages aren't tracked as CVEs because basically they are not logical flows. So sometimes they are tracked as CVEs, most times they are not. If they are not, every different company has its own standard. I can tell you, <laughs> it's not a good idea for every company to have its own standard how to uh, identify a malicious package. We need better standards. And if CV is not, the, is not the right place for that, we should think of a right place to do that. We need a virus total of malicious packages, for example. So where we are right now, right now, this is the last slide. Right now, uh, we are really focused about health and wellness. We have moved along to talk about SBOM, which is great, because right now we have visibility. 
which is the basic cornerstone. We are getting away and we are getting a bit more informed around malicious packages. That what we need to do to be better prepared for the future, we need to start to think about developer reputation or contributor reputation. Should Brandon be somehow uh, pointed out that maybe you don't want to use this code? That's a really interesting problem. We need to start to think about behavioral analysis. We are very good at looking at the code from a vulnerability or a point of view. So if a code is trying to touch an SSH key, trying to steal my AWS code, trying to do something like that, that's a different set of rules we need to look at the code at. And we need to do like on a continuous uh, result processing. So for example, in my team, I have threat hunters. Every time we found a malicious sample, we go hunting and we found other malicious samples. So we, we are able to stop the attacker. Just deleting the malicious packet and say, that's it, problem solved, won't get us anywhere. So this is, this is where we are, that's where we need to be. So we're off to a good start. I know that a lot of the people in this room are working on clever ideas to move the bar even further and, and, and allow us. So for me, the call for action from policymakers here is I'm not expecting us to fix everything tomorrow, but let's start with a central repository of malicious packages that will be shared with universities, governments, other companies together, so we can all have better understanding of the problem. I think that's the first step we could start with. I'm not sure what will follow, but if we don't understand the problem, there is no chance we're going to solve it. With great power come great responsibility. Our software, our responsibility. Thank you, guys. Sorry if I took a bit. But it's okay. That was great. And, and thank you so much, Zach. Um, that was a, a, a very illuminating uh, uh, presentation. And uh, I'm sure it gave us all a lot to think about. Um, we're now going to do a, a fireside chat with uh, with my colleagues uh, from the U.S. and U.K. governments. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, government involvement in ICT supply chain security with Eric Goldstein and Ian McCormick. Eric is the Executive Assistant Director for Cybersecurity at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency in the United States Department of Homeland Security. And Ian is Deputy Director of the U.K.'s National Cybersecurity Center, or NCSC. Uh, what I thought would be good is for Eric and Ian, in each in turn, uh, take a few minutes to set the stage um, and give us your, your views on the problem set, what governments are doing, how they're working with the private sector, um, which will give us a, a nice landscape on how we can dive into some, some further questions. So Eric, we'll lead with you, and then, and then uh, Ian will go to you. Great. Thanks so much, Chris. And that was a great presentation. Phenomenal stage setter. Uh, so nice to be here with, with this group. I think this is my third or fourth chamber event in three days. So we are, we are doing it right in Israel. I um, wanted to start off just with some, some definitional conversations because it's been a, a big couple of years for what we call supply chain risks defined really broadly. But we use that term to say a couple of different things. And so I think it's useful at the outset, at least from, from my point of view, to delineate between two separate kinds of risks that, that we sometimes bucket under the same category. And the first is what I'll call dependency risks. And those, I think, are manifested by incidents like the solar winds intrusion campaign, the Kaseya ransomware incident, where an adversary abuses a trust relationship with a vendor or other business partner and uses that trust relationship to propagate malware or undertake some other malicious activity. And it's a supply chain attack of a sort, but very different from the kind that, that we're talking about on the screen. So, so I'll put that in the category of, of dependency risks. Um, separately, you know, I'll talk about called true supply chain risks, which are the software and indeed hardware that we are ingesting into our networks uh, and that is running as part of our IT infrastructure. But I think both of those types of risk have a common problem, which is trust, um, which is you know, we are trusting our security to third-party vendors and suppliers and partners with whom we give privileged access to our networks without knowing what's running on their networks or who's operating on their networks. And we give, as the presenter previously described so eloquently, extraordinary levels of trust to the developers and producers of hardware and software that is running on our network, of course, inherently, often with full privilege. 
So, so how do we join together these two categories of risk and get at this problem of trust? And it's a really hard problem because we are not going to be able to, in the real world, get the same level of trust for everything running on our system, whether it is a business-to-business -business trust relationship or a software package. And so building on, on a point from the opening presentation, the key really has to be prioritization. It has to be where on our network is the risk of of a lack of trust, whether in the software we're running or in, or in the relationships that we are having with outside parties, where could that cause the most impact on the essential functions of the organization? In the open source community, one, one area where we are leaning in in U.S. government, and I'll call out my colleague Joyce Carell, who's doing some foundational work here from the Office of the National Cyber Director, is thinking through how do we figure out what are the open source packages that are most important? to the U.S. government and therefore more broadly, right? As, as we just noted, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of open source packages doing all kinds of things and hundreds if not thousands more being produced every day and every week. And so we are never going to get to the same level of transparency, visibility, SBOM for every open source package being out there. But what we can say is these are the packages that we think, A, are doing something really important or B, are being included in software components where if there is a log4shell-esque vulnerability would be most consequential, and then we can shine a light on assessment, on maintenance, on improvement for that slice first, and then build from there. And, you know, maybe a decade from now, we'll say, you know, all the packages we're using are, are equally secure, but that, that would be a, a utopian vision. And we can do the same thing with the dependency risks that I put in the first category, right? Every single business-to-business -business relationship, every single trust partner does not have the same consequentiality. But, you know, if you're a small, medium business and you are using a managed security provider to, to, to functionally run your network, that's a pretty critical partner. You might want to make sure that they're not going to be able to drop your directional malware on your network without, without you knowing it. And so taking that same sort of risk-based prioritization and then putting controls and measures in place, starting with the most critical, is really the only way that we're going to make significant progress to that end. Eric, thank you very much. Ian. Great, thank you. <clears throat> well, yeah, thank you for having me today as well. And, you know, it's all from back to Eric's remarks about previous presentation. Well, you yeah, showed in really, you know, quite stark terms, some of the challenges I think we've got in the software supply chain, and, and no, no thanks, Eric, as well for your your, your remarks. Um, some, you know, some of, some of the things I wanted to pull out um, here by you know by way of introduction is, I mean, I, I think you know, particularly over the last couple of years, you know, we've seen just how critical the technology supply chain is to our you know to our way of life, to our society, to our economy, and this was it really stark during the COVID pandemic when all of a sudden you know, we had to but very rapidly to new ways of working. We had support um, functions that we hadn't had support by, you know, so some of those sort of technology work streams and supply chains and that, you know, that challenge um, has really, you know, been like quite sustained and quite stark for us. Um, in terms of supply chain, I mean, one of the things I, that I often like to do when we talk about supply chain is drill into which part of the supply chain challenge are we looking at and trying to address. It's such a broad spectrum. I mean, we could be talking about everything from kind of service providers, cloud, cloud service providers, software supply chain, as we've had some of the conversation, you know, through to raising some of those standards across the broader supply chain and you know, I think recognizing that there are that there are there are organizations that, that you know maybe not IT organizations, but the the resilience of the, the systems that they use is critical to functions um, that, that we rely on through through some form as well. So we need to be quite quite careful and we need to consider quite um, we're, you know, quite analytically, you know, what are we actually trying to address across the supply chain and taking that risk-based view that, you know, that, that Eric just talked about was um, particularly important. Um, there's a couple of areas that, that, that I would um, wish to focus on um, today. And, and, and again, you know, they, they, they align with, um, with some of the remarks we've already heard. I mean, the first is that focus on, um, on managed service providers. And the, and the reason why, you know, I'm particularly focused on managed service providers at the moment is because that's where we're seeing currently a lot of the attacks. And you know, and I suspect that's because of you know elements such as those those MSPs they frequently have you know high levels of network privilege into um, into um, into customer networks. They often have privilege with multiple customers, so attacks scale quite you know quite quite rapidly. Um, and then perhaps as well, you know, sometimes I see that those relationships aren't quite as 
firmly on the um, on the radar of the network defenders as perhaps you know they might they might otherwise be. And um, and then of course you know software supply chain, which is you know a lot of the topic today. When we talk about you know, physical supply chain, traditional supply chain, it's incredibly difficult to know that supply chain, particularly at the you know below sort of tier one supplies. It's very very difficult to understand the whole thing. So you know so we need to prioritize and take that risk based prioritization, but. I think that challenge becomes you know even harder and more acute when you talk about the software supply chain for you know for some of the reasons that we've just you know we've just heard about you know the developers using packages and those packages are brought in and you know we've got this you know this really considerable end to end um, end to end sort of understanding and um, uh, sort of you know challenge problem there so you know that's where I think we you know we need to start to you know perhaps you know put a bit you know a bit of our efforts to take that you know that risk based view you know what what are we you know what are what is critical to our functions what are we relying upon. And then we, you know, and then we, you know, we try and gather some of the information that's necessary to manage some of those risks around there. Well, thank you, uh, thank you both. Those were both very, um, very interesting remarks, and I, and it was very helpful how you you tied it into our, our opening keynote. Um, and I'll start um, with something that you had referenced, Eric, uh, about software bill of materials, and, and Ian referenced it as well. Um, you know, I think this is this is something that we're hearing all the time, right? It was, you know. Last year, zero trust, and all zero. Now it's all S bomb all the time, and I guess you know some people talk all about zero trust too. Right? Well, I know, I know. We, we, yeah, we can have we can have multiple ones, but uh, but but some people talk about S bomb as if it's the cure all, that it's a panacea for security and transparency. But you know, like many things, those statements are are both true and not true. Uh, and so I guess you know it would be helpful for us to talk about some of the advantages and limitations of S bomb, and and how can they uh, help promote long term supply chain security. Absolutely. So, you know, as a table set, SBOM is a means to an end. Um, the the end is to have the transparency into the software components that are that are operating on your network, such that you can more quickly identify and manage risks. Um, that's the goal, right? The goal is to understand what is running in a way that you can define the risk, determine if that risk is within tolerance, and if not, take steps to draw it down. Um, having an SBOM, of course, actually does nothing in itself to define the risk, ensure that it's within tolerance, and then take action. But without having that bill of materials, you're unable to even get started. And so I think you know, SBOM really is in many ways analogous to, to a uh, you know, long enduring concept, which we're still not very good at, which is basic asset inventory. Um, you know, you know, if you don't have an asset inventory, you can't manage vulnerabilities, you can't manage configurations, you can't manage privileges because you don't actually know what's running on the network. Software bill of materials is precisely the same model, and so you know, even as we still struggle to get good asset inventories across the board, you know, we really do need to keep pushing software bill of materials such that we can even begin the conversation of managing the risk of software running on our networks because without having as bombs in place, we can't even get started. Now, we are at the point in the evolution of, of S bombs, and I'll call out here Dr. Alan Friedman on our team at CISA, who's just done foundational work in this area, frankly, for years. Um, you know, we're at the point now where I think the community kind of gets that we need more S bombs, right? This is this is positive. We need to drive uh, you know, adoption both with the producers of software and the consumers to drive the market. Uh, but we're also moving in a few different directions. And so the call to action, I think, for the community is to make sure that we are continually coalescing around interoperable and automatable S bombs that can be rapidly ingested by by security tools, such that we can understand quickly. You know, I will just use our our favorite example of the usefulness. Of, of an SBOM, you know, we can understand if a vulner, vulnerable ber- version of Log4j is running on our network, and then we can make a smart risk decision about how to mitigate and when. And so, you know, understanding where Log4j is deployed actually does nothing to help you manage that risk, except that lets you begin the process much more quickly uh, to, to take action to reduce the risk. And, and I think it's just such a profound case example because, as some might recall, during the global response to Log4Shell, uh, CISA stood up a public GitHub repo where we cataloged products that were impacted by vulnerable versions of Log4J, um, which was great, but also I really hope that in five or ten years that is super unnecessary uh, because it was extraordinarily painstaking to get all the vendors and researchers and do a manual repo. I, I mean, it was, it was uh, at the time, innovative, but not what we should be doing, right? We should be able to just look at the software running on our network, 
do a quick query of, of our S bombs and immediately say, oh look, we're running log, we're running vulnerable log 4J on these four products. Here's where they are. Let's go patch or take some other mitigation and do that almost instantaneously. And so ideally, when we have the next big open source vulnerability, which we will have, just like we'll have the next big proprietary vulnerability, you know, we'll we'll in increasingly be able to move much more quickly because we'll have the transparency that enables mitigation. Yeah, that's good. And I'm glad you mentioned the interoperability and ingestible data because, you know, some of the detractors would say, well, this is just going to be a really long Excel spreadsheet and it's going to take people, you know, hours and hours and hours to figure it out. So it's good. It's good that you're talking about that automated function from the, from, from the outset so that that, that becomes part of the conversation. It doesn't allow for that detractor. But Ian, um, I wanted to, to, to stay on SBOM for, for one, one more minute. Um, and, and really, when we're looking at the creation of uh, effective SBOM rules, going to require uh, effective consensus building uh, within, within air aspects of the government, with the private sector. Uh, and how can governments, uh, both with their own, uh, you know, internationally and, and domestically, avoid rigid requirements? and promote flexibility in, in what is a constantly changing environment, as, as Eric just alluded to. Great, no, th thank you. And, um, and, and Eric, thank you for that, that repo of, uh, of impacted, uh, sorry, that, yeah, that, that, that uh, of, of impacted repos with Log4J, because we pointed at that quite extensively in the UK as well. So that was you know, really useful. Um, I mean, we, we see significant utility um, in, um, in SBOMs. You know, it's definitely um, going to be something that can be particularly helpful for that log4j type um, scenario, but we recognize some of the challenges too. Um, so I think, you know, that sort of the, you know, the, the, the truth of the place we're in at, at the moment is, you know, how do we, how do we make a start and how do we start to get some of that benefit? But we have to recognize that there are some challenges to overcome as well. Um, uh, how do we avoid, how does government avoid rigid requirements? I mean, within the UK, we tend to, you know, we tend to, you know, very much set um, outcome-based um, requirements in terms of the advice that we give and, where we um, where we work with um, with regulators or lead government departments to set standards, we tend to take that outcome based focus. So, you know, what 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 I'd suggest in in terms of avoiding sort of you know the, the sort of, you know the very you know rigid rule set is that we would take that same outcome based approach across the sort of the, the the challenge domain that we're talking about here with you know understanding you know where for example you know there might be um, you know there might be vulnerability within you know, within your you know within your um, uh, your sort, you know, your, your software pipeline and what an organisations might do uh, about that to encourage the adoption of, um, of, for example, S bombs. But you know that that whole standardisation process as well is something that you know probably you know, would need to mature a little bit before we would go too far down down that path. Very well, thank you. And I, I know we're 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 moving along, and I'm going to uh, keep things going. I, I did want to ask a question, and it gets at um, what we've seen. Recently, uh, really since uh, just before the start of the war uh, in Ukraine and, and coming up, joint seal uh, alerts. So you know, there's the U.S. government started doing it, and I thought it was it was it was a, it was a very pleasant surprise to see something coming out from FBI and CISA, and then it was NSA was added to it, and then the U.K. government was added to it. I mean, that that was a you know a real watershed, and I think it would be great to hear both of your perspectives on why those documents are important, why it's more than just a uh, another logo on a page, and and what does that mean for um, for like-minded governments uh, in tackling problems, uh, both on uh, ICT supply chain security, but broader the cybersecurity ecosystem. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it goes without saying that our goal when CISA and our government releases an advisory or a product is for every cybersecurity professional in the country to sit up in their chair and say, oh. I have to do something today. I have to go look at this product and assess the controls and practices on my network and ensure that I've taken the right steps to address this urgent issue, be it a threat or a vulnerability or a campaign. What we have found over the past few years is when the U.S. government speaks with one voice uh, across all of the different agencies with cybersecurity equities, um, that message is heard much more clearly and with less ambiguity across companies in the US. But we also know that the vast majority of major corporations are multinational, um, and there are sources of expertise around the world that certainly go beyond the US federal government. And so our model at CISA, and, and, and I'm sure Ian would, would agree here, although of course defer to him, is you know, to really multi-seal multinationally by default wherever we can. And the reason there is really simple. It is just to reflect the joint credibility 
of our respective cybersecurity agencies in a way that helped drive the message and drive uptake and adoption. And, and it's really as simple as that. Our view, and we've heard this certainly anecdotally, if not driven by data, that when organizations, and I think the question question implies it, when organizations see that you know the US and the UK or all the Five Eyes partners, uh, as we did for Log4j, come out with a product, you know, organizations sit up and say, okay, this is something that we really need to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And it, it really is important for us to be able to come out with our, you know, with our, our partners, our partners in the Five Eyes and indeed, you know, partners beyond where we can, you know, and that might be talking about the threat or it might be issuing alerts or advisories. And some of those can be quite tactical, talking about IOCs, and some of those can be quite strategic, such as the, the recent um, advisory on MSP security, which was a product that, that, that had the seals from all five Five Eyes mm -hmm. nations and multiple organizations within, um, within the US as well. And I think you know it's it's really powerful, and it's a it's a it's a good example the MSP um, advisory because in you know in some ways it didn't say anything new. The advice in there was you know well established advice, but it's the fact that all five nations are saying it together, and we're saying it clearly, and we're saying you know, you know hey providers you know these are the things that you need to do, and consumers these are the things that you need to focus on, and I think that that's a really powerful message when we can all coordinate um, around it, and it also gives us. You know, because you know, within our individual nations, you know, we might have different standards and different approaches for compliance and things like that. But almost transcending that, if we're asking the same things of suppliers, it gives a focus and allows those you know, those suppliers to be able to um, to say, well, you know, this is this is the direction that, that all of these governments are um, uh, are moving in. So that's really really powerful. Yeah, and I would say I know that when we have uh, events where we bring in government speakers, you know, Eric is a is a uh, is a is a, a, a welcome guest every time. Um, but w when we have CISA and FBI together, or it really makes an impact on our members that that this is one team, one fight. And Ian would love to have opportunities to bring you on as well. I would give each of you thirty seconds for any parting thoughts, uh, anything that we missed that you want to convey to our audience. You know. I I think that the fact that we are having this conversation in this forum is really critical because I think, you know, before even a year or two ago, uh, supply chain security, uh, again, harkening back to the opening presentation, was really seen as a side issue, uh, as a as an esoteric issue, even for an issue, uh, even an issue that was outside of the purview uh, of the cybersecurity team. And that's really changing. And so I think understanding uh, supply chain risk, again, both dependency risk and software and hardware supply chain risk as a core inherent part of cybersecurity and managing it as a pillar of an effective security program, including through practices like SBOMs and using SBOMs to drive action um, are going to be really critical as we go forward. Great, thank you. I mean, and this is, you know, this this conversation, this is, you know, really inherent to achieving some of our aims that, you know, we sometimes put under the banner of secure by design, you know, how do we, you know, how do we build those kind of, you know, those kind of Kind of outcomes, but you know, perhaps you know, looking a little bit bigger than that, some of the conversation we've just had. I mean, this is a you know, this is a global challenge. These are global products. Um, we need to coordinate. We need to act together globally to address those those challenges, and you know, come up with you know interventions and approaches that can that can scale up and that can work for all of us. Well, listen, uh, Ian, Eric, thank you so much for uh, for your participation today, for your thoughts and insights. Uh, it was very illuminating to me, and I trust it was for our audience. So please join me. In Um, now, uh, I'd next like to welcome to the stage Tim Mackey, who's going to provide some thoughts on how to understand the complexity of cyber threats to ICT supply chains and how businesses should be prepared to navigate new government requirements. Tim serves as Principal uh, Security Strategist at Synopsys Cyber Research Center, uh, where he works to accelerate access to information on the identification, Severity, Exploitation, Mitigation, and Defense Against Software Vulnerabilities. Tim, welcome. Thank you. So I've got about 15 minutes or so of slides here, and I'm actually going to take a little bit of the software producer's perspective. Um, as we've seen, as we've heard, there's a lot of complexity that's in a software supply chain, but it fundamentally actually boils down to what you're going to do with the types of information. So I'm going to start out with a simple definition. So I assert that a software supply chain is fundamentally four things. The code that 
your team's right or the code that goes into your organization that is custom and proprietary, some set of libraries that represent the foundational elements for it. That could be a serverless environment. That could be a containerized environment. That could be a low code, no code environment. This is all code. When we talk about hardware appliances, guess what? There's software running in storage systems and networks. This is all code. So this has to be factored into what your dependencies look like. Then we live in a connected world. There are lots of microservices implementations out there that are going to be passing data between services that are local, services that are third parties. That ends up being part of that software supply chain. And then, of course, there's the various behavioral and configuration elements that go in there. Now, to look at the impact of a software supply chain, we first have to look at how software development's evolved. 10, 20 years ago, everything lived within the four walls of an organization. Test coverage, libraries, frameworks, development languages, those were decisions that were made within the four walls of an organization. The organization nominally understood what the risks were from those decisions. They may have been point in time decisions, they may have been perfectly legitimate, and then three years later, completely illegitimate. But that's the way software development is, or was. Modern software development says, hey, I'm going to have a, a set of suppliers. So if I have an application that my product team is creating, they might have four dependencies in there. That's four suppliers. One of those suppliers may themselves have another set of suppliers, which may have the same supplier in multiple scenarios. This chain plays out very deeply and in some research that we published earlier this year, looking at about 2,400 commercial applications, the average number of dependencies in this, effectively the average number of suppliers in those 2,400 commercial applications was 508. We saw an example with 811 earlier, 508. Those are scale problems. Solving for this across the multitude of applications in an organization, that's a scale problem. Give you an example. I did a presentation at Black Hat last year. Very, very simple application. I want to put Instagram pictures into Slack. Why? Why not? That application written in Node.js, I declare eight dependencies to make that work as eight suppliers. One of those is the interface that Slack creates to go and bring their API in. It's called Bolt. It's a really, really comprehensive library. If I dig into Bolt, I see that it has 15 dependencies. So it has 15 suppliers. One of those suppliers is called Express. Express has, well, 30 suppliers. And if I walk this chain just within Bolt, I've got 133 separate dependencies at various levels representing 133 separate suppliers going to a depth of eight but here's where it gets really, really complicated quickly. There's a class called buffer in there. There's a class called safe buffer. And there's a class called safer buffer. All of which are manipulating the same type of data in the same kind of ways, nominally in a better form. There are also instances of expressly deprecated as an end of life components. This gets complicated. So if I look at one of those deprecated components, a component called request, at the point in time that I did my Black Hat session, there were about 52,000 consumers of that component. You would expect with a component that was declared deprecated in February of 2020, that this number would go down. It went the other way. Six months later, there was an extra thousand people who discovered the value of request and had completely missed the blazing red label on top of this component that said, do not use this, it is no longer maintained. Some people said, oh, well, you know what, I'm going to fix stuff in here. And then they got a little upset that the merge wasn't happening. So they said, any ETA and when this is going to actually get patched? The answer back was, you know, this thing is old. It's got expressly, it's done. The developers have walked away. They've gone to do something else. Yeah, but I want my component thing in here. Um, you should really move to another one. Yeah, but you know what? My problem is that I've got a component that depends on a component that depends on this. So what do I do? And this is one of the core challenges 
when we start looking at how software supply chains are constructed is that you may not have a suitable other option and your supplier may actually turn into code you own and code that you're responsible for just through the normal evolutionary nature of a supply chain. In the world of open source, projects come and projects go. I've contributed to dozens and dozens and dozens of projects over the years. When I decided I was done, I walked away. I stopped contributing. This project did a really good thing by having an express end of life statement and then connecting the dots so that people couldn't just go and override it and take over the project. They did all of the right things, but this still ended up flipping around and saying, okay, it's still out there and it's still doing its thing. Now, that represents a class of risk that isn't captured anywhere. Another class of risk, that same report that I cited earlier, well, we looked at the most vulnerable frameworks that were in there. Number one was jQuery. Nobody in 2021 and 2022 decides that they're going to write an application in jQuery. It does not happen anymore. This was code that was designed whenever it was designed and nobody maintained it because jQuery came in somehow. It may have been a foundational decision. Same thing with Spring Framework and Lodash. These are not decisions that are made on an ongoing basis. These are one and done type decisions. That helps explain why we're starting to see CVEs that rather than getting patched and their incidents going down, they're actually going up or they're worse year over year because they're somewhere deep in the intricate nature of that application, that framework. That represents risk when you look at these five that are up there, they're all some form of remote code execution that is triggered by some form of data validation of a user supplied input. These should be patchable. Some of these have been around for well, four years now. APIs. If you've ever tried to dissect API endpoints and microservices uh, architectures to go and figure out what the data flow is, this is the next horizon. We have the software components themselves, but they're acting on data. They're doing things. If they suddenly have a new phone home mechanism or a new datagram, and that's going to be part of how they function, that's part of the overall risk. Now, from a supplier side perspective, there's a lot of risk assessments that occur. We get asked all the time, gee whiz, provide your proof of X. Here's your ISO 27001. Here's your SDOC for this or that. That's all typically done around a risk management strategy that is business focused, it's vendor focused. It may have a manufacturing supply chain component into it, but these are things that are at the outset. They don't scale with IT related issues. They don't scale with vulnerabilities. They don't track that. The software supply chain, well, last year, the NVD recorded an average of 52 new CVEs every single day. And it's only been going up. So if you don't have a clear grasp of what you're doing from just basic vulnerability management, the rest of the puzzle becomes that much harder. So one of the things that we're advocating for is an understanding of where you have managed and unmanaged risk within the vendor relationship. So mobile apps, line of business apps, MSPs, that goes through some form of vendor risk management, gets you some checks against some GRC controls, and you end up actually having an approved vendor. That's done at the outset of a contract which means that there's a whole lot of unmanaged risk that's coming through unmanaged procurement. So think updates, think in-house developed code, think contracted code, think open source, think commercial third-party libraries. These all rep uh, represent avenues where code can come in and behaviors can come into an organization that you need to be able to capture. Otherwise, you have that unmanaged risk or you have a fluid situation. Now, SBOMs, well, they've become all the rage over the last year. I refer to them as they're not the silver bullet of operations management. If you have an SBOM, that's awesome. If you don't know what to do with it, well, you need to figure that out before you start saying, hey, everybody needs to give me an SBOM. You need to figure out why you want it and where it's going to fit in your process. It can communicate a lot of really useful information, but it's kind of like if you know what's in the oil that goes into your car, and you don't know yet 
that you're supposed to change the oil every so often, that knowledge of the composition of the oil isn't really going to help you all that much. You have bigger problems to solve for. So, for example, the CISA notification yesterday about VMware Horizon users still being vulnerable to Log4j. If you don't have a patch management pro process that's going to solve for it, you're kind of operating at a disadvantage. Which gets to the topic of software supply chain risk management. And so let's look at functionality, reliability, safety, security, legality of software. Um, it's both build and buy. And importantly, it's not enough to say that you do it. You have to be able to prove that you're doing it. So NIST has provided guidance around this. OMB's provided guidance around this. And these are things that as a producer, we all need to start thinking about how do we actually prove that we're doing the right sorts of things. Because even when we look at the basics of how things are working, um, we find, for example, in the UK uh, survey that was published earlier this year, not yet even half of the organizations are doing a first order software supply chain vetting of their suppliers. They're not yet at that point. And that's this year's data. So we already have DevSecOps teams. Shouldn't they be solving this? Well, they're really focused on things like, how am I getting new features out quickly? I'm measured on feature velocity. I have a lot of contextual testing around stuff. But that's not a risk management paradigm. I've got InfoSec controls in place. Well, that's worrying about things like the confidentiality of data, uh, authorization controls, encryption firewalls, and so forth. None of these are actually trying to understand what the supply chain risk is. We've got these controls in place, but they need to meet somewhere in the middle. And where this happens is NTIA has defined a set of SBOM requirements. If you are down the path of saying, I want an SBOM, at least make certain that what you're getting complies with the NTIA. Minimum, minimum bar. Oops, one too far. The next thing is to look at your overall software development practices. The SSDF, also special publication 800-218, is a big deal. Go take a look at it. If you subscribe to other standards, like say ISO 62443, there are equivalencies and mappings to the SSDF, but you need to make certain that you're actually developing your software in a secure manner. And that that manner actually takes into account how risk-based uh, operations are going to progress. That you understand that even with internal supply chains, you're going to have different levels of risk tolerance and risk exposure as each element is being produced. So that's my 15, 20 minutes. I thank you for um, uh, your attention. We're going to bring up the next panel, um, Robert, and I'm not certain exactly who else is on the panel. Um, I think we have to share. So you want to share? Uh, <laughs> our last speaker, let's just give him a round of applause for Thank you for your contributions. And uh, what we're going to do, folks, is give everybody the good news of knowing we're going to be leaving on time. Uh, so uh, I know it's truly the last thing between you and some. Uh, perhaps libations or other enjoyment, but uh, let me start by welcoming our panelists. So yes, I'm Robert Mayer, I'm Senior Vice President of Cybersecurity and Innovation at U.S. Telecom. Um, and I have been involved with um, supply chain for many years through one of the mechanisms, which is the Department of Homeland Security um, ICT Supply Chain Task Force. You'll be hearing some of that. Uh, today, where I co-chair that with a representative from the IT sector, as well as uh, the, a government representative, and we have about 12 agencies on that project. Today, with me, to my immediate left, is Joyce Correll. And Joyce, I'm not sure if the title on this document is right, but I know based on the last 15 minutes or so, 
you are the Senior Technology Advisor to the Office of National Cyber Director. Do I have that correct? Excellent. And then to uh, Joyce's left, we have Uval Sine. Is that, is that close enough? Good enough. Okay. Good enough, okay. Head of the Active Cyber Defense Department um, within the Department of Israeli uh, National Cyber Directorate. And then to his left, we have my good friend and colleague, Catherine Condello, who is, and we'll find the magic card here. Um, and if I don't find the magic card, I will just say it by memory, but Catherine is the Senior Director of National Security and Emergency Preparedness for all Lumen Technologies. And then Miho, who I in an email today called Miho, Miso, and Mini. Um, and she was quite gracious, but Miho Matsubara, I hope I have that right, is a brilliant chief cybersecurity strategist for NTT Corporation. And then there's my colleague, Eric, whose card says that he is... Eric, you are the, give me a second, because I'm playing with the cards here. I've got the second card. is Director and Senior Policy, Public Policy Council for Samsung Electronics America. How's that? <laughs> All right. So very good. So to begin with, I thought maybe we would just go down the line and ask folks to talk exactly about what their role is in supply chain. Um, as a way of in further introduction. So, Joyce, why don't you begin? Thank you. Um, I think this is turned on. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, so, my name is Joyce Corral. I am in a very brand new organization called the Office of the National Cyber Director. Um, yesterday, my director, Chris Inglis, um, did one of the keynote presentations, kind of laying out his vision for, uh, for this new organization. Um, it was created by statute. It is part of the White House. Um, my first job title was employee number six. <laughs> so I've now evolved to having a title that's more than 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 just my position and arrival on duty. Um, I arrived on the team, so it's that's how how new it is. Here we are in the summertime and very entrepreneurial, getting up and off the ground. Um, so one of the things in the in the supply chain realm that I'm involved in, um, as we we look down the road um, from from the vision that Chris articulated is um, <coughs> for resilience from a present and future resilience perspective. And how do we look at the technology and ecosystem security? In, in that particular context, the technology and ecosystem security you know, runs the gamut to include things like supply chain risk, third party risk, to the decisions that we make from a technology perspective. We heard people talk about open source software and the challenges posed by that. But there's another piece to the ecosystem, which also includes human capital. Um, and I think everyone's already heard other speakers this week address the need for or, or the gap in filling positions and cybersecurity positions. So how do we move forward in filling those positions where we need real cybersecurity talent? And then even more broadly, uh, how do we enable our people in a digital society to you know, realize the benefits of a, the rich ecosystem that the Internet provides us? Okay. Well, okay. thank you all bit. Okay, my name is Yvonne Sinai. I am a head of uh, Active Cyber Defense Department at I I INCD Israel. I lead the Israel Supply Chain Methodology, uh, the new version. And uh, on my previous role, I was the editor of the Cyber Defense Doctrine 2.0 for, uh, for the public, based off NIST CSF, so thank you, the NIST guys. Uh, and uh, we also use the uh, public standards and unique knowledge and experience from uh, the organization from Israel. Uh, if we will talk about uh, supply chain, uh, about uh, before uh, two years ago, something like this, uh, I instantly understood that the uh, supply chain risk is increasing. Is uh, this not as uh, some uh, trend that uh, we uh, plan to go away and uh, we need to resolve it? Uh, we had a lot of decision uh, to, to take and we uh, create a partner with the private sector and try to understand, first of all, the threat landscape the challenges, and uh, we understood that uh, the private sector don't have a unified solution for it. The, we create a, a methodology that uh, try to resolve the most common TTPs that we see uh, outside. We, we understood that we cannot uh, provide a foolproof solution to the market. 
and uh, then we can create a certification body that uh, can, can uh, uh, pro provide evidence to uh, organization and also other attestation level that you can uh, talk about it later. And uh, but, but this we implemented in the market and we try to invest uh, the decision maker to support it and invest and uh, deploy it in the organization itself. Catherine? Uh, again, Catherine Condello with Lumen Technologies. Um, I think where I have most of my chops in terms of supply chain is in helping to run the DHS ICT supply chain risk management task force. Uh, Robert didn't go into any details, but this task force has been in place for over three years. And it is um, somewhat renowned in that it comes together from communications uh, sector providers, major IT sector providers, as well as a counterpart of departments and agencies throughout the U.S. government. Um, over the last three years, um, we have done a number of efforts to sort of create the frameworks within which one can address supply chain. Now, I know we just saw two presentations about supply chain at the, I'm going to call it the micro level, but we're, still, we're, we're talking about it not only at the micro level, but the very larger levels, you know, you know, supply chain issues associated with ownership, supply chains. Are, so whether, whether, no matter what tier you're working on, we're doing this sort of thing. So among other things, um, for the frameworks for being able to think about supply chain more regularly or more, not regularly, routinely, uh, academically, with more rigor. Um, this uh, supply chain task force has done everything from develop taxonomies to the types of threats that could now be perceived in a, in a supply chain environment, have created vendor templates that you can use so you can to try to assess whether or not this is a good vendor to use or not, and it's not specifically whether it's about, you know, is it your energy provider or is it your hardware provider, but generic templates that you can use to sort of do a quick cut on these sort of things, um, as well as uh, did work essentially focusing on what are any existing legal barriers to doing information sharing about supply chain threats. Most of us know again, that we can operate under a supply chain. You know, we can we can share threat information. If, if, if we do, if we uh, anonymize it, we don't say it was Jack or Joe. We just say, well, these are the tips and these are the tactics and these are the the, the hash marks. But when you're talking about supply chain, occasionally you want to say, you know, we bought this stuff. We think it's wonky, and it was built by X. Well, you can't do that. You can't say it was X. So we did a rather exhaustive study on what would be the last sort of um, legal liabilities or mitigations in law that would need to be put in place so that we could do that. Uh, we will talk about other stuff with the, um, uh, that this task force has done. Uh, in, 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 the, in one minute. Uh, all right, so uh, let's, uh, Michal, your role in, in supply chain. Is that, is that live? No, okay. Hello? Yeah. Okay. Oh, it's working. It's working. Okay. Okay. Here we go. Okay. I, I just wanted to make sure that this is not hacked. <laughs> yeah, it's a supply chain risk management, right? So my role is not to, to control my microphone, but rather mm -hmm. <laughs> cybersecurity strategist uh, for NTT Corporation. Um, so I re directly report to Global Chief Information Security Officer, uh, Shinichi Yokohama, and our team is called Security and Trust Office, which is in charge of uh, corporate security governance, including uh, supply chain risk management. And we actually use uh, NISC cybersecurity framework as a global common language to define our uh, corporate cybersecurity governance. So we are so excited to see that uh, NISC cybersecurity um, framework 2.0 draft is uh, more uh, working on um, supply chain risk management. So NTT is fully committed to the journey to create a new NISC uh, cybersecurity framework 2.0. Thank you, Eric. Your role. All right, good afternoon. I want to thank uh, the Cyber Week organizers for inviting me to participate in this distinguished panel. My name is Eric Tamark, and I lead U.S. Uh, cybersecurity and supply chain security policy out of Washington, D.C. for Samsung Electronics America. Um, for those of you who don't know Samsung, we are the world's leading uh, consumer electronics and semiconductor uh, manufacturer. 
We design, we manufacture, we deliver a trusted and secure ecosystem of ICT products, including chips, network equipment, mobile devices like this uh, Z Fold uh, 3 that I am reading some of my notes from, uh, PCs, displays, and wearables. Robert, back to you. Okay, so I think some of you covered uh, a little bit of the programs, but I'm going to ask you to dive into it a little bit deeper, and I'm going to start, Joyce, with you, okay? Um, I know you have had a, a employee number six within the National Cyber Director. It's a very new, statutorily created um, organization, um, but how are you thinking about supply chain, given everything we've heard in the last few days here, the the diversity and the expansive nature of supply chain, how do, how do you approach it uh, from a, a kind of a strategic and national perspective? So I'll, I'll answer that, you know, strategic, strategic, tactical, and practical. Um, but I want to um, reference a little bit um, what one of the earlier speakers who's, who said that, you know, supply chain as a topic is something that's been around for a while, but it used to be as an esoteric topic. You know, it used to be the topic where if you had friends over and they stayed too late, you could talk about supply chain and then they'd leave. <laughs> but um, now over COVID, everybody learned about supply chain. It was an issue that became, you know, dinner table conversation where even children began to understand if you couldn't bring something home from the grocery store, hey, it was the supply chain. Um, <laughs> so, so we have organized um, at the national level, at the White House in our organization, we're, we're pulling together all of the agencies that have responsibilities in this particular area. One of the challenges we have is that sometimes we are our own worst enemies. And in supply chain risk management, there, there are roles where um, many times um, one person assumes the other person has handled the risk. So in supply chain risk management, you know, we're thinking about buying goods and services. So you have your acquisition workforce that is out there buying things. And the acquisition folks are buying things on behalf of the CIO and the IT department. The acquisition people assume that the CIO and the IT department has kicked the tires on the technology and you know, you're good to go, the, the, the risk has been thought through and there's a mitigation plan in place or there's no risk. So the, that's what the acquisition people you know, perceive. Whereas the CIO or the technical workforce thinks, hey, that acquisition person is, you know, I said I, w I wanted to buy something and they're gonna go out and they're gonna sort out if that company is all that they say they are and that they will manage my risk. I just need to be the technologist. I don't need to worry about that. So, so these partnerships, these, these relationships, um, uh, the dialogue does not happen organically with these different lines of businesses. And the awards and recognition for folks um, are, are solely within a line of business. An acquisition person is not rewarded for doing the, the perceived job of a CIO and vice versa. So you need to have a way to drive from the top down how to bring these different communities together. This even includes the legal community. Because in the legal community, you need legal support uh, from um, attorneys that have experience in contract law, experience in trade law, experience in intellectual property protection or, or defense law. Um, so a whole bunch of different legal disciplines you know, come to bear in the supply chain risk management milieu. And, and Catherine sort of alluded to that as the challenges with information sharing in that space as well. So, so in, in the US, we passed a law back in 2018 they're directing the federal government to put in place supply chain risk management programs. That's sort of the, the um, strategic and tactical perspective. So now from a more practical perspective, from um, an open source software, we've all seen that this is a challenge um, where adversaries use the software supply chain as a threat vector. Adversaries have been doing this for a decade, but the, the trend line really hit, hit a watershed moment in around 2000, 2017, and then the business of attacks you know, picked up in 2020 um, and you know where we are at now. So we have launched um, an open source software initiative for the government to work with the private sector, um, addressing addressing basically three lines of effort. One is looking at um, security at the source. Uh, there there is a perception that there are thousands upon thousands of people you know writing um, open source software, and that there's absolutely no way to understand you know how to look at this particular um, population of people. Uh, in our conversations with organizations like the Linux Foundation, you know, they've been able to neck it down to about 200 people. You know, there's, a, there's a tractable number of individuals who are the ones that are developing open source software for you know, critical functions. So if we can work with those people um, and, and ensure that they have the tools they need to do secure software development, I think we can you know, lift, lift the bar for, for all. So we have an effort underway there. 
um, our, the National Science Foundation has grant monies that they're issuing to, to drive this forward. Um, Eric mentioned uh, the you know, software bill of materials. The transparency is a very important piece of this. Um, but when we think of a software bill of materials, that's only one piece, which is when you uh, get your data from an SBOM, that should essentially be, if you can think of an analogy of the flashing red light, you know, this is the warning. So you look at the data you get and go, oh, these are the things I need to worry about. Well, there's a companion piece to that that is underway right now. It doesn't have a very um, a good label yet, but we're calling it Vulnerability Exploitability Exchange. So when you identify a vulnerability, your know, Log4j has been described as one of those. Um, if there is a company that has used that, used that now we know vulnerable piece of source code in their product, but they have they have adequate mitigations in place, let's find, in pla let's find a means by which that company can say, and we are not vulnerable. So maybe there's an exchange where companies can say, hey, um, as you are doing your asset inventory to find out if you have this vulnerability, our product, we're fine. So that's the measure by which that red light gets turned off. So those are two ways that we're looking at that. The third piece is only beginning underway is the defenders that are using this, how you know, how can they um, improve their lot in life from a security perspective? Great. Val, um, I'm going to ask you to go a little bit into the program you've developed over the last few years. When we were here uh, for the last Cyber Week, I think the program was just beginning. You were beginning to establish three different levels, I believe, for validating uh, supply chain. Uh, can you talk a little bit about where that is now and how it's evolved uh, um, and some successes or what you've learned from that experience? Okay, uh, we give a short overview about the program and the success or the challenges that you have uh, deploying in the market itself. Okay, first of all, we uh, did a lot of discussion with the private sector to understand what are the key challenges, what are the problem, and uh, how we can uh, provide solutions for this uh, area. Because there are lots of, a lot of issues that the uh, customer can say, we need to resolve it, but in practice, cost money, we require effort, standardization, etc., etc., et extra. We try to adopt multiple or external standards such as ISO, but in practice, we see that ISO don't provide any real solution to security protection. Or for instance, many organizations that uh, was attacked by 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 another organization uh, as a valid standard ISO certification. But in practice, didn't have a solution uh, that uh, provided a real protection against a common threat like uh, phishing, etc. So after it, we, we map a co common TTPs or the target, uh, the tactics and, and, and other procedures that they take use in the market with technologization. And then we, we build, build our, our methodology. And we understand that we cannot cover all the TTPs, or all this, uh, and the solution is usually basic agent to against this uh, common threat. And then we, we create a certification and the attestation level is is uh, almost complied to CMMC for the United States, for example. We didn't uh, uh, try to invent the, the wheel. The good best practice is outside. So the first level of attestation is safe attestation where the CEO or another board member sign, I comply to this uh, certificate, this is uh, this uh, standard requirement, and that's all. The other level is the, the, the same attestation, but provide evidence to the customer itself. And the third level is uh, using third party certification, most cost, most the costly certification itself for the attestation level. And usually customer don't like to pay for it, and then, one of the challenges we see, we see uh, the supplier say, why I need to pay for this certification? The customers say this, the same. You want to work with me, so you have to pay for it. So we're going to pay. The, the, the due dilemma, we, we call it usually. Okay. And uh, if we talk about the key challenges, uh, we work in the market, public market, but in practice, the lack of awareness, but uh, and, uh, lack of business motivation. Because usually, if the, the, the regulation don't force or the tender requirement don't force that uh, someone to comply this the standard, any standard, not even security, we see it on the safety, etc. They usually don't don't like to comply and approve it. Uh, we try to using POC in, a, in a many customers. 
to understand what the, what is the challenges to deploy in practice and usually we understand what is the common field of the, or challenges in practice in practice but the core is not as the sign itself but the investment in the background because the organization need to purchase solution need to change the process usually one of the core problems you see organization don't have BCP this is a continuing process itself so we have a joke about the DRP the, the organization uh, have disaster want to uh, create initiate recovery but they don't, they don't have some uh, operation uh, planning working. So it's a joke, but it's something that you should see in the practice. Why the, the, the mutual expectation between the customer and the supplier don't exist? No? And uh, one of the things you see that uh, when we go to a uh, contract, it is not some issue, but the contract is not, not created transparency between the customer and the supplier. Uh, the, so the customer usually don't understand what you get in, in practice. There are no common metrics. And uh, and after it is, if you have some uh, some incident or or some business issue, they, they they say okay you are you are in charge of the problem you are in charge, and they usually this black hole that we need to resolve. All right, the next three speakers obviously represent industry global companies that um, are part of the supply chain and very dependent on it. So I'm going to add, get it to it a little bit of a micro level here, Catherine. From Lumen's perspective, what are the biggest challenges um, that you have, uh, given your global presence and your the demand for availability of your services, twenty four by seven? What 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 are the things that really strike you as being the most critical aspects of supply chain risk management? This complete and utter lack of consistency. I mean, we're going from an environment where um, the, the procurement professional, you know, was worried about time and value and money and doing the right things. And, 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 if, and if you're in the university now and you're learning procurement and logistics or whatever the, the topic is, um, you will not recognize your degree eight years from now. Because now you're going to be looking at everything from, you know, ownership issues and sanctions issues and cybersecurity issues, blah, blah, blah. So we're in an environment where it's sort of a brave new world. And while there's a foundation for how to do, you know, good supply chain risk management, there are now a new whole level of perturbations that have not been contemplated. So what we find in the 60 nations, and you're in a couple more nations, um, is that everybody has a different opinion. If we're already in an environment where we're trying to, to leap from, let's say, baseline procurement kind of logistics or sort of supply chain risk management to something that's at a higher level, I don't know that we can jump from, let's say, you know, first year college to a PhD. Instead, would it not be easier, better, at least more efficient, perhaps be able to sort of cut away some of the, the low hanging malevolent fruit by just saying, this is going to be the standard and we will revisit it. If we could have some consistency, this would allow us to really focus on those various aspects, whatever they may be, globally, to be able to have common conversations with our vendors, uh, with the people that we're supplying, with our customers. Um, so we're looking for consistency. On some level, I don't care what it is, but let's all sort of do it the same so we can all approach the same and we can all be rowing in the same direction. Neo, um, you're the strategist, chief cyber strategist. So you're always thinking five steps ahead, whatever, several years ahead. How are you preparing for what Catherine's describing, the evolution of supply chain and risk management? Sure. So Catherine just touched upon the great point uh, inconsistency. So, so I want to stretch it a little bit to talk about inconsistency uh, between uh, small and medium-sized businesses and major companies. Mm. Because even though that over 90% of uh, global companies, uh, companies uh, around the world are small and medium-sized companies, and they play a uh, great role in our supply chains and manufacturing, they do not have resources to invest in cybersecurity. And this is a huge problem, especially during the COVID, because they, they have less money to invest in the manpower and the cybersecurity um, solutions. 
so so we we just we we meaning uh, Japan just got a um, uh, ransomware attack hitting um one of the, the major automobile part manufacturers, and it um suffocated um the, the operations of a uh, major Japanese auto manufacturers uh, plant operations for one day. And think about it. So so we had uh, major global companies and also regulators uh, from different countries needs to come up and help small medium sized companies to they will never have resources enough to invest in cybersecurity. So what we need to do is to share um, resources, um, cyber threat uh, inter uh, cyber threat uh, risk management, uh, basic level of knowledge, and also to give them some funding to make sure that they have some resources to do uh, basic cybersecurity measures. Is the Japanese government prepared to do that funding? So actually we do. We have five steps ahead, or maybe ten steps ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Um, Eric, I'm going to go to a kind of a broader policy question for you and ask you, from your perspective as a global supplier, um, what, what, what do you see as the biggest threats in the supply chain arena, and what kinds of policies um, and programs do you think at national, at the national and international level would be most most helpful for an organization like yourself? Thanks for the question. Um, I think the problem is managing third-party risk. And um, we've seen in the cybersecurity um, realm, one of the most significant longstanding problems is boosting basic cyber hygiene across the connected ecosystem. Probably heard this a million times during this conference. Like you're only as strong as your weakest link, right? And that if everyone does the basics really well, um, it's going to raise the costs for all the malicious actors. In the supply chain security context, I think the same adage rings true. Uh, we've seen that if your suppliers or your partners aren't managing or communicating their supply chain risk, it's going to be a huge problem for your organization, your products, and your mission. However, when companies are doing their part on supply chain risk management, and um, communicating that, uh, the high, uh, high tides will rise with all boats. So um, what are we doing uh, from a Samsung perspective on this? First, we're collaborating with industry to develop and implement cybersecurity standards and uh, best practices. But um, practically, we're also adhering to a security development life cycle, as well as our NOx security um, principles, including securing hardware, um, a hardware root of trust, so that when we sell our devices to our customers, we empower them with cybersecurity, so that we enhance the uh, security and supply chain security of the entire group. Um, Catherine, I want to switch to you for a second. So part, one of the major efforts that we undertook in the task force, and Joyce, you were involved in it at that time also, I'll ask your perspective, was to actually study COVID-19. And we did a report and we found certain items that were changed dramatically as a result of the disruptions with COVID. What, what, can you tell us a little bit about what we saw there, what we found there, and how likely are we to resolve some of the problems we identified, frankly, two years ago? Thank you. Um, just as I was saying that, you know, a procurement logistics degree eight years from now is going to look differently. Believe me, COVID has had a, it's going to have a big ratcheting on the, um, uh, the curriculum as well. Um, the first thing that the, uh, the task force uh, said was a learned lesson from COVID was that while I think most people have diverse vendors, they hadn't necessarily had diverse vendors in diverse geographies. Um, so, you know, the, the old mantra, you know, you know, have diversity in supply. I think people kind of understand a sort of base level, you know, supply chain risk management, but certainly COVID, you know, where found, you know, let's say you had five separate vendors and they were all in one country and they had all shut down. Well, okay. So that's being revisited. Um, the second thing that really came up a lot, uh, in this whole process was sort of the, once again, traditional just-in-time lean inventory practices. 
we have gotten so accustomed to always available overseas. I can get FedEx, UPS, DHL, whatever overnight that, you know, the lean inventory process, which has made companies more effective and more efficient and certainly um, more uh, you know, less expensive to the consumers trying to buy their products. Um, you have to, th we, you're going to have to sort of rethink that from a lean inventory just in time to a sort of a, well, definitely just in time, but then where is my just in case inventory? Okay, so that's phase three. Um, I think we spoke to this um, and we certainly heard a lot of bubbling up from the prior uh, is the lack of transparency. I mean, I might, you know, here with NTT, I might buy from Samsung, and because I've worked with Samsung for years and years and years and years, and he's sort of not gone through my normal sort of vendor thing, I have faith in him. Good job, you know. But how far, how deep did I go? How are what are his vendors? Who are his vendors and vendors? And those vendors and vendors and vendors. The 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 tree from that is just astronomical. So there's uh, transparency issues, and particularly now we're looking at software issues, hardware bearer materials, um, open source code. You know the degree to which you have to unpack that. How much do I rely on it? That transparency is the new challenge. Those were the three major findings, and I'm sure people have. Representative polls that they can add to this. Joyce, your your reaction to the report or any other perspectives you have on COVID? That okay. Sure, thanks. Um, so, so, so the work that this task force had done, you know, fed into a number of other things that were going on across the government. Uh, when President Biden came in and, and was, you know, confirmed as, as the president, one of the first um, efforts he initiatives he launched was an examination of um, America's supply chains. So that he issued an executive order looking at ten different supply chains. Um, so the ICT supply chain was one of those, but the, the you know government organizations were tasked to look at um, advanced batteries, um, looking at uh, semiconductors, the semiconductor sector, the um, um, energy sector, the transportation sector, the food and agriculture sector. So uh, organizations were directed to examine and these different sectors from a supply chain perspective to identify shortcomings, like you know where pe people were seeing. You know, from a variety of suppliers who were just in one geographic area. So, what were these different shortcomings? And the recommendations that came out of that, you know, have led to discussions about reshoring, onshoring, um, whatever shoring you want to call it, um, uh, and Venturing. and initiatives with um, other governments um, to to talk about how do we source from allied nations um, in ways that that will fill these gaps, and then what are the resources, short, medium, and long term, that we need to invest in these different sectors so that we have you know, trusted markets that we can rely on. Um, from An important takeaway from this, um, and th th these are efforts that, that will, will go for the next decade. So for example, one of the areas was looking at critical access to critical minerals and strategic materials. So that's, a, that's a, an issue where if you want to want to look at mining the you know, critical minerals for all of these electronic components, you know, you know, uh, digging holes in the ground and you know, environmental protections, these are things that take a long time to, to put in play. The important thing, this is a, from, from my perspective of the work in supply chain analysis here, is that this is the first time in the U.S. we have actually baselined these sectors. That's an important thing. So as, as others here from other countries, maybe from Israel, you know, and, and you look at your supply chain risk from a very macro perspective, there needs to be a baseline, you know, before you can actually begin looking at investment prioritization. So I believe that's sort of a big takeaway. All right. Um, Val, do you have any experiences with COVID that impacted how you manage supply chain risk? Okay, I think that we adopt uh, many ideas. Also, the, the United States and other countries they usually uh, point it. Uh, but I would like to mention something like this. Uh, COVID-19 is phenomenal, but I think that the future... Nobody knows what, what, what will be happen. So we need to understand how to uh, plan ahead to respond to unknown known threat with unknown meaning how to resolve it in practice. Mm -hmm. This is what, what happened in COVID. Many countries didn't uh, got a, a real solution for it. There a lot of panic. There was a lot of a gap in the time frame to resolve or, or to initiate risk assessment what to do, what to do, uh, 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 how to minimize the, the effect to each nation and how to work with collaboration and other, other nations to close this gap. Because I think 
the major thing that we need to understand how to create a unified solution or collaboration between countries to minimize the gap. We cannot close it in practice, I guess, but we can't minimize it. Because if someone go from border to border have a disease, the same can apply with product, with software, open source, etc. And sometimes we can see open source that nobody can know it in practice in critical infrastructure. And this creates a lot of risk in the countrywide area. And we don't understand it in practice. I guess that all beside the cyberspace, we have also another solution that will result in the country, in the country area and the multinational culture. Okay. I'm going to take the, you, go ahead, Eric. Right. Can I just give two real world examples? Sure. Okay. Number one, um, public private partnerships on the operational level during COVID was, was crucial. Yep for ICT companies. Uh, we worked with Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity Infrastructure Security Agency in identifying critical essential workers so that uh, manufacturing could continue. We worked uh, to make sure that PPE could be distributed. Um, <laughs> uh, she's laughing at this, but it was really important. And also just- You see her spreadsheet. <laughs> yeah, okay. um, and, and making sure that the communications networks remained operational yeah. under unprecedented demand. Um, the second lesson that we learned, uh, and this is a Samsung perspective, is that we had a, um, a challenge in, in, in resiliency. When COVID lockdowns shut down our um, network manufacturing uh, facility in Vietnam, first we had to ensure that uh, our workers there were safe. But after that, we had to, to uh, move our supply chain to Korea. And I learned this firsthand when I was over uh, at our net network's uh, manufacturing facility. And, and we continued to deliver to our customers um, without delays, uh, without increase in cost, and the same sort of trusted, secure supply chain. Very good. Neil, do you want to add anything? You, uh, or can we go to the next question? You tell me. Uh, we can go to the next Okay, question. great. So, because I promised that we would finish on, on the time. So, there's a lot of discussion about in cybersecurity, but also in, in supply chain, about whether regulation is going to be effective in, in managing a risk or whether you can have voluntary frameworks or can you have something in between where, for example, uh, if you want to do in the United States now business with the Department of Defense and there are several hundred thousand companies that fall into that category, you're going to have to meet certification requirements. Um, how do you think about balancing, on one hand, the desire to regulate and try to ensure some level of accountability versus a more voluntary framework where you hope that there's sufficient accountability. Who wants to take that first? I can take that. Good. Um, so from a, a critical infrastructure uh, company perspectives, and then, uh, I would say it's going to be hybrid because there's, because as on a global, globally based um critical infrastructure company service or on a, on a service provider like Lumens or um, Samsung, uh, we have to comply with so many regulations and guidelines and compliances. And of course, we, we try our best, but we have to deal with so many different types of risks for supply chain risks and also cyber attacks, um, geopolitical tensions, uh, trade war, and, um, and uh, natural disasters. So we have to balance between the, our risk appetite and also to balance and, uh, our resources mm -hmm. to best allocate. So I would say that a hybrid uh, would be the, the best ways to give us an uh, allowance for uh, flexibility to, to deal with uh, any potential risks we would face. I'm going to go to Joyce. Okay. Um, so um, so from, from a national security perspective, um, the, the, the notion of, um, you know, a a natural disaster is that's bad, but it doesn't necessarily, um, you know, fit into, you know, you know, are you worried about a nation state actor in your supply chain? So, you know, those, those are sort of, the, you know, the concerns we have. I certainly, um, um, having always been on the government side of regulation, I am sympathetic to the industry perspective that industry is overly regulated or has so many different things that um, uh, companies need to comply with. So one of the efforts we have underway is to harmonize criteria across the different regulatory regimes. One regulatory regime is federal procurement. 
So, so when, when we look at, at sourcing goods and services, Lumen provides services, Amazon provides goods, mm -hmm. you know, what is the criteria that, that we are using to say this is the type of company we want to do business with? Um, uh, then um, if we have our, our regulator for the Federal Communications Commission, you know, how is that regulator looking at um, companies in the sector or in the energy sector? So we need to be able to harmonize criteria so we don't have a situation where one arena, the criteria is incredibly stringent, and then in another arena, it is so loosey-goosey that it undermines what we want it to achieve. So we are in, in the process of you know, establishing you know, across the government organizations you know, a way to navigate this um, and a way to then be able to com communicate with transparency and predictability mm -hmm. in the private sector to, to understand. So the responsibilities on both sides, the government and private sector, to be able to help manage manage risk in a collaborative fashion. Val, what do you think? I think I, I can add something that the, one, one my my two cents. I think that the government should help the private sector to help itself, because we cannot provide all the solution and the, the local cost uh, cost issue in the, in this side. But we can we can provide tools for risk management, risk consideration. And of course, protect our critical infrastructure. But I think this business side that we need to provide added value to the market itself, that it can protect itself. Catherine? You're asking me if I want to be regulated, I want to be a hybrid, I want to do self-attestation. <laughs> he wants to be regulated because God bless the regulators, no matter how much input they get from us or from industry and they go through the whole process, some of it's really not right and it's not effective. And ineffective regulation is a, a waste of resources. On the other hand, you know, if at least you could figure out what it is, thank you for harmonization and regulation. I, 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 I will throw a big party. Um, you know, to the extent that everybody understands the rules, and there is a harmonized right. This allows us to be able to say, well, if this is the harmonized rule, is it really appropriate for a company that has 20 people? And then you can start to really sort of dig down. But at least if you have that sort of harmonized approach about this is how we're going to tackle this everywhere, not just in the U.S., but everywhere. Um, then we can really focus on getting to the objectives that this was trying to accomplish. So, no, I don't really want regulation, but if we could get some consistency there, I, I think we could make some good progress. Okay, so I think we heard a good set of positions here. We've got five minutes. Everybody gets one minute to sum up the most important message that they think they would like to deliver to this convening. And the whole world is listening because this is live linked, I think, or whatever. Eric, you want to start? What's your? Boy, a lot of pressure there. Okay, um, look, um, you know, public private partnerships, the state of that is very strong, at least from a US perspective. Mm -hmm. I guess we about it earlier, but Samsung task force, the FCC, the IT sector. Coordinating council. So that relationship is valuable. We have to continue to uh, build on that. Uh, the other piece is, is the trusted vendors. We need to talk about that. Men, folks in the audience, Prague, uh, technical and non technical considerations. Folks can come out, talk to me after what we're doing. Joyce, I'm going to skip to you for your last minute because I know you have something to say on that yeah, subject. Eric, excellent, uh, great, great um, setup. Thank you. I wanted to talk about, you know, what do we think about trusted suppliers? So we do, um, um, you know, we we um, endorse the product, product proposals and, and welcome, you know, the uh, other nations joining in in that endorsement. Um, a lot of countries, our partners in the UK and others, you know, have reached a point where when we look at supply supply chain risk and we're evaluating a vendor. Um, we have broken things down into technical factors and then non-technical factors. So when we think about non-technical factors, you know, from our perspective, you know, that is, you know, do, is there transparency? You know, does, does a company have transparency? You know, what is, do we know ultimate beneficial ownership? 
and you know who's who's calling the shots at a particular company is that transparency there or is it an opaque system where we don't know who's who's running or owns anything um, and then an, another another fact or another um a, a characteristic of of a a more trustworthy um uh, a vendor would be responsibility and so does a company um if a company suffers a cyber breach um you know do they sit on that data and you know for you know weeks and months or do they come forward with that information to be able to then uh, uh, come jointly together with their customer to solve solve the problem created by the by the breach? And then a third piece of that too is um, uh, the the um, original equipment manufacturer. You know, are they in a country where the legal regime is an authoritarian regime, and the government has um, more sway over the company, and the company is truly not independent of of government direction? And in this in this particular space. The U.S. government, from a federal federal perspective, and we we um, execute five million contract actions a year, just from the federal government perspective. That's a lot. And so, as we look at being able to evaluate um, uh, uh, um, uh, risk with, with related to a particular third party uh, company, we need to find a way to to uh, do that uh, with some type of scoring mechanism, some type of automation. So you know, how do we develop this criteria that is there, thereby harmonized you know, across across different legal regimes, so that we can we can quickly come to either um, a, a a position that yes, our risk appetite for this procurement for this mission, and we're satisfied with the risk, or um, we realize we have insufficient information that and therefore need to dig a little deeper to determine whether this is a particular. Uh, um, uh, Contract that we want to actually negotiate. So that's sort of a kind of a strategic look at, from a supply chain risk management perspective from our point of view. Catherine, twenty seconds. Between these two, we're good. You're good. <laughs> um, Mio, any any uh, message? Sure. So be, because this panel discussion uh, was made in, the, in collaboration with U.S. Chamber of Commerce, I, I wanted to highlight the role, uh, the, the important role that uh, our local. Um, Chamber of Commerce is playing uh, in each country because the Chamber of Commerce uh, has a trust, trusted relationship with the regulators and also major companies and also small and medium-sized companies. And they have, they are great, actually doing a great job to, to bring in our regulators to, to share their honest opinions and also that, that create a trusted environment to have an honest discussions of how regulation should be and how the small and medium-sized companies can do for uh, risk management or supply chain risk management. So and, uh, I, I, I really appreciate it that you are here today. And uh, I'm sure that uh, uh, the each of you can have a, a great discussion with local chamber of commerce for the better uh, supply chain risk management. Yeah. But let, let me echo that, Chris, you're here. I want to really thank the, uh, the effort that has been made consistently and the remarkable uh, work that's been done uh, to bring a delegation of, I think, 50 people from the United States to, to Israel uh, to really um, learn and admire what's happening here in Israel and to continue a dialogue of how we can, re you know, support each other. And I want to thank the hosts from Israel and Tel Aviv University and the sponsors of the conference for all of their work, uh, you know, through this conference. And I especially want to give a round of applause to all of the panelists who just did an excellent job. Thank you. Only one minute over. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.